the, the coordinator of the Agile Benchmark Cash Crop Network. And my second hat today is the uh, co-lead of the uh, regional scale uh, farm level and regional scale integration network of the GRA, GRA initiative. And the, the reason why we uh, invited you for this webinar is because we have been in touch with both Mark and Axel on uh, scientific basic for climate change uh, and climate mitigation strategies in agriculture. And as you probably all have heard about, uh, policymakers and industry is very excited about the opportunity for farmers to contribute to greenhouse gas mitigation strategies. And uh, at least in my perception, one of the two most prominent options to do that is both changing tillage systems and in incorporating straw. And uh, both our speakers for today are have been involved deeply in, in this these two topics. And as indicated in our invitation, there are some question marks regarding the validity of these options, and we thought it would be very useful for the scientific community as well as for decision makers in industry and policy to understand the challenges that are actually associated with that, these two options. And with that, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Mark Liebig from USDA as one of our first, as, as our first speaker today, and Axel Don from Thunen Institute. Uh, he will then follow after the presentation from uh, Mark. Our idea for the organization of the session is to have the presentation and then specific questions to, to the speakers each, and then in the very end have a, like a joint discussion about what kind of conclusions can we draw from these two presentations regarding the possibilities for growers to contribute to greenhouse gas mitigation strategies. I hope you can agree. And please either raise your hand in the discussions or uh, also write in the chat so we will make sure to uh, answer your questions. Uh, one last housekeeping message. So we will be recording this session to make it available, especially for those colleagues who for time-wise are not able to participate today. I hope you can agree to that. Otherwise, if you don't, you probably have to leave if it's really bad for you. Um, yeah, with that, I hand over to Mark and a very warm welcome to you. And we are very happy to have you here. The floor is yours, Mark. Very good. Thank you so much, Yelto. I appreciate the uh, the invitation uh, to share. Um, uh, I guess before I get started, just a, a little background on me. I, I work for the USDA Agricultural Research Service at a uh, field station in Mandan, North Dakota. It's uh, the Northern Great Plains Research Laboratory. I've been here for about 22 years, and uh, much of my research is framed under the context of uh, uh, rain-fed uh, dryland farming, uh, mostly wheat-based cropping systems, um, uh, looking at both uh, soil property dynamics, but also greenhouse gas flux. Uh, I guess in addition to that, I, I do like Yelto wear different hats depending upon the day. I also uh, serve in, in various contexts uh, for the, uh, the, the Croplands uh, Research Group as part of the GRA, uh, uh, currently serving as co-chair, at least for, for a few more months anyway, until they find someone to replace me. Um, but uh, it, it's, 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 a, it's a good platform, and, and so uh, and, and I think uh, through this platform and through the network that Yalto has developed uh, through the integrated uh, research group, uh, we are here today. So, so I'll um, I'll sh share my screen and um, bring up my slides. Go presentation mode. So, uh, if you can just give me a, a, a thumbs up or something to show that that's working. Okay, very good. All right, wonderful. All right, so, um, right. So as as, as Yelto pointed out, uh, Axel and I are going to to talk about this carbon farming topic, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take the the no-till uh, component of of uh, of this discussion and and lo look forward to your questions and uh, and, uh, and and what we have to share afterwards. Um, 
Uh, certainly, it's a broad topic. Uh, this one that has really generated a lot of attention. If you have followed uh, some recent webinars uh, hosted by the Inter International uh, Soil Carbon Network, you know that, that this was actually a topic that was brought up, uh, I believe, in September. Humberto Blanco Conqui and uh, and Stephen Ogle gave a presentation on this topic of no tillage and 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 uh, and carbon soil carbon change. And so I've I've kind of taken a, a sort of using their their perceptions as a starting point and and extending a little bit further uh, with uh, some things that I think are important to consider from the context of mitigation. Um, as as far as a uh, sort of a, a roadmap for the talk, I don't have that many slides, about 20 slides, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a little context for those of you who may not be familiar uh, with this topic. I think a, a few slides on the front end uh, would be helpful, but then the, the bulk of the presentation, we're just going to go through and, and essentially review uh, what the literature has had to say about this topic, about no tillage and carbon stocks. And then I'll, I'll wrap up with a few slides, some additional considerations that I think we have to uh, to, to think about um, with respect to, uh, to to understanding no tills effect on on not just carbon but the overall greenhouse gas balance. Okay, all right. So to start out, um, certainly uh, agriculture is being looked at as a as as as, as an important uh, an important contributor to be able to mitigate greenhouse gases. Uh, globally, and you can see this through a, a number of, of initiatives over the, the the last ten years, and certainly with with COP26 uh, just uh, finishing up, there there certainly will be additional initiatives uh, to be able to accelerate some of these climate smart agricultures, uh, climate smart practices um, from agriculture. One major component in all of this, this mitigation uh, uh, initiatives uh, that are being proposed has a lot to do with, with the role of, of our practices to affect soil carbon balance. And, um, and so when we, we look at the carbon balance and trying to, um, to, to uh, excuse me, I seem to have, an annotation attribute turned on, and I can't forward my slides. Um, let's see. Let's see. Hmm. Let's see. Okay, there we are. Sorry, I must have uh, punched a button incorrectly. I apologize for that. But um, getting back to the issue of recarbonizing soils and looking at carbon balance if we want to if we want to be able to increase soil carbon we have to look at the the carbon inputs and outputs and 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 adjust management to be able to to shift things so that you have more inputs and outputs i have found you know there have been many talks that i've given in this past year about this issue of 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 carbon trading and carbon balance and and it's helpful to be able to compartmentalize um, these, these inputs and outputs with respect to different management practices for farmers to understand what they would need to do in order to be able to shift to, to, to a practice that would result in greater carbon accrual. Now, um, now, now most generally, these, these practices that can, uh, that can contribute to uh, carbon accrual uh, fall within three broad categories. There are cropping practices. So cropping intensity, cropping diversity, inclusion of cover crops um, of certainly perennials, both uh, grass species and woody species, very important from the standpoint of understanding carbon balance within our agroecosystems. There are also amendments. So, so certainly you're probably familiar with biochar or rock dust. Those are two practices that are showing a lot of promise to be able to, 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 to uh, increase soil carbon. And then finally, there, there is the reduced tillage and no tillage in particular as a way to be able to, to, uh, to, to, to increase soil carbon. And, 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 and no tillage is 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 it's been around uh, for about 30, 40 years, depending upon uh, you know how far you go back. But but uh, broadly defined, it's a it's a system of, of planting crops where you, you essentially do not disturb, disturb the soil other than to essentially create a slot to plant the seed and cover it. So there's there's very limited 
uh, disturbance uh, overall. It's referred to is it by many different names globally, uh, zero till, direct seeding, slot planting. There are probably other terms that that are that are used depending upon what part of the, the world you're from. But uh, uh, but it, but it all follows the same premise of minimizing uh, disturbance except during planting. Based on the, the most uh, recent uh, uh, census of agriculture, at least here in the United States, it's practiced on, on 42 uh, million hectares. And so that would be continuous no-till practice, no tillage whatsoever. Okay, so with that context behind us, let's transition to the literature and see what, uh, what the literature says about uh, no tillage and, and soil carbon stocks. The, the first stop on this journey originally goes back to um, a series of papers that, that were published between the 1970s and 1990s from individual studies. Uh, th this actually brought me back to my, my, my master's degree work. I was you know, doing research on soil property dynamics and conservation tillage practices in eastern Nebraska. So I was reviewing all of these papers that had been published in the 70s and 80s from the early studies that were established here in, in the United States. And, and this, this paper in particular, this from, from Blevins, was a, was a study that was started in Kentucky in, in I believe, 1973. And it, it was the, the outcome was very common, whether it was this study or Western Nebraska or, or the, the long term study in, in, in Ohio. You'd often find that no till would have a, a substantial effect or on, on soil carbon in, uh, relative to, 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 to conventional tillage, and that you would see almost twice as much soil carbon in the near surface depth, the top five centimeters uh, roughly. Um, um, but then that that difference would 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 dissipate uh, with depth, but but there was definitely a a, a, a an accrual happening near surface. Now, the the, the caveats with with some of these studies uh, at the time, you know, the the assessments were very uh, very much focused on 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 the near surface depths, um, the, the top thirty centimeters generally, and soil bulk density wasn't always reported. So our ability to be able to actually express these uh, results on a, on a on a stock basis were were, were compromised, and so. So there are many, many papers that were published like this, and it wasn't until 2002 where Tristan West and Wilfred Post did really the first broad meta, global meta analysis uh, on, on tillage effects and also crop rotation, um, looking at, 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 at uh, papers throughout the world, 67 long-term experiments, 276 paired treatments, but again, Focusing their their meta analysis on the top 30 centimeters, and, and what they found um, from that was that that uh, there, there were greater soil organic carbon stocks in no-till relative to conventional till, and that they, they, furthermore they found that most of that carbon accrual was actually happening right at the surface, the, the, the top seven centimeters in soil in this case, and they. They, they, you know, from their analysis, their meta-analysis, they calculated a, a sequestration rate of uh, 48 grams of carbon per meter squared per, per year. That's, I think, about 1.76 metric tons per hectare, if you're more familiar with that. So, uh, so that's, a, that's a pretty decent uh, accrual rate. All right, so, so that sort of got the ball moving on meta-analysis. Now, the following year, Bert van den Biegaard with Ag Canada uh, in Ottawa, him and, 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 and Edgar Gorich and Denny Angie published a, a, a similar type meta-analysis paper, but they focused on, on what was going on in Canada. And they had 62 two studies, 291 pair treatments, and there was a little bit difference in the depth at which they sampled, the, 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 or the data that they had available and the depths from which that came. Uh, in Western Canada, where things are, are drier, more uh, uh, wheat-based cropping systems, that sampling depth went down to about 38 centimeters, whereas in Eastern Canada, corn-based cropping systems, a little bit heavier soils, they went down to, to, to 70 centimeters. What they found was, was different. They found that, that there was no difference in soil organic carbon stocks between no-till and conventional till, but there was a, a strong regional difference. Whereas in Western Canada, you were seeing accrual, but in Eastern Canada, there was carbon loss. 
So this begs the question, what's going on in Eastern Canada? Well, to find that out, you actually have to go back into the literature and look at a paper that was published by Denny Agee in 1997. What Denny did with collaborators, he sampled eight different locations in Eastern Canada for, the, for two, two different toolage treatments, and these treatments had been in place for at least 11 years. And, and what he found there was that there was actually a redistribution of carbon throughout the soil profile. So in the top 20 centimeters, you saw that no-till had a distinct advantage in carbon rule, but from the 20 to 40 centimeter depth, actually it switched and there was higher carbon under Mulberg plow, conventional till relative to no-till. And then there was even a numerical, you know, it wasn't statistically different, but, but it was a numerical increase in uh, mobile plow relative to no-till in, in, the, in the 40 to 60 centimeter depth. So, that, so as you can see from, from, from this graph, it, it, it's a redistribution, which when you take it over the entire profile, there's no difference between the two. Now, this is Eastern Canada. And so there were some things that were going on that Bert van den Weigart speculated. You know, certainly as you invert crop residues with Mulberg plow, you're moving it down to lower in the profile with the limited aeration, limited decomposition. Um, the other thing is, you know, no-till in Eastern Canada may not necessarily confer a yield benefit. If there's a lot more moisture there uh, relative to Western Canada, there are also differences in the the, the primary crops being Eastern Canada being more corn based and and uh, and Western Canada being more wheat based. There's differences in seed and ratio there with the residue that's going into the soil, at least on the on the surface. And then there's also differences in earthworm activity in Eastern Canada that might actually facilitate more uh, a residue incorporation and, and decomposition um, there in Eastern Canada. So so. It, so, so it's, what it showed is that there, there was no broad systemic response. Things were different based on different parts of, of, the, of the country. Um, the, the 10 years later, so, so then, then, then I think the, the really, the, the paper that really blew open the doors in, in us scrutinizing no-till was this commentary by John Baker and his colleagues at, at uh, the ARS unit in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, what they said is that they, it's like, listen, it's very clear that there are difference in rooting characteristics between no-till and conventional till, whereas there are, there tends to be more, a uh, higher root length density um, in, in surface depths for no-till, but the opposite is true in lower depths, whereas actually conventional till has higher root length density in those lower depths. And the, the fact that you know our sampling that at, at, at just at the near surface steps actually does give no-till a favorable advantage, and so maybe all these results that we're seeing, and he was pointing primarily to the West and post meta analysis, but but the belief that 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 we're actually seeing higher soil carbon accrual in no-till maybe is very much an artifact of the sampling methodology and what we need to do is that we need to sample deeper in the profile as Denny had done with his study in Eastern Canada. He also pointed out, I think this is very important, is that you need to be able to also marry this with gas exchange measurements, which at the time, at least for the, the results that were coming out of Eastern Nebraska, there was no difference between conventional till and no-till. In, in using micromet uh, uh, methodology, and so, wow, and so this is this really opened up the doors for a number of meta analyses to really scrutinize the the the, the effect of no-till on carbon. Now, I'll, I'll I'll summarize in a couple of slides. I've, I've broken these up in roughly six to seven year periods. Um, these meta analyses either they they either were very much focused on, on no till or they looked at a broad spectrum of, of kind of sort of climate smart practices. Starting with Govarts in 2009, global uh, evaluation of 78 studies, uh, pretty much across to, you know the uh, the entire soil profile depth where the data was available. What they found in about 50, just over 50 percent of the studies, no till had greater soil carbon than conventional till. Uh, seven studies, less in no-till, and in 31 studies, 40%, no difference. Lou et al. actually did two meta-analyses, one for Australia and one for a, a global data set. And in the Australian uh, evaluation um, was, was focused on, on the top 30 centimeters, and there, no-till, 
greater solar carbon conventional till. But when he broadened to look at, 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 a, at a global data set that actually sampled deeper, there are no differences across the profile. Um, for Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean conditions, Aguiera in 2013 looked at 21 publications, a, a mean sampling depth of 34 centimeters. So th there were lower depths, but the mean was, was just, just under that, that, that 30 centimeter mark, which was common to a lot of the previous evaluations. They did see carbon accrual under, under no-till at a rate somewhat, uh, somewhat similar to what uh, 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 Weston Post uh, observed in 2002. Going on from 2016 to present, uh, Neil Hathaway uh, published just an amazing review in environmental evidence uh, focused on warm, temperate, and boreal regions. A very, very thorough study, quite a substantial paper, 31, 351 studies across three depth increments. Found that no-till did confer an advantage on carbon stocks in the top 15 centimeters, but when you looked across the entire profile, no difference. Stephen Ogle in 2019 published a, a global meta-analysis, 178 sites that um, that 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 looked at 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 uh, uh, soil carbon stocks. Um, it was many of the, the the results were to 30 centimeters, but there were also some some results at lower depth where data were available. And there, uh, he observed that that there was uh, greater no, uh, carbon under no-till relative to conventional till, uh, but in the top 20 centimeters. And then it changed as you went below 20 centimeters. Then actually, no-till had less than conventional till. But he pointed out, and, and quite clearly, that there was greater uncertainty that we that, that with with uh, those carbon measures measurements that, that, that as you, you increased with uh, with sampling depth. Um, uh, by uh, published a, a global analysis, uh, a meta analysis, 470 publications, uh, four depth increments. Again, pretty similar, greater carbon near surface uh, that switched around in the, the second depth increment, and then in the lowest depth increment, there was no difference. And then finally, just this hasn't been, I guess, it's just just recently published here. The pub paper by Das was the first to really look at the effect of no-till in tropical and subtropical regions. Uh, evaluation of 84 publications, five depth increments, and seeing no difference between no-till and conventional till across all depths. Um, so th there's possibly other meta-analyses out there that I missed, but I think there's enough here to be able to come away with some sort of generalizations. And th those generalizations that, that at least I derive from this is that no-till, you know, it's not a, a, a universal strategy to increase soil carbon. There seems to be certainly a benefit and in near surface depths, but as you go to lower depths, um, no till is the, the the stocks can be less. And when you look across the entire profile, uh, there often there are there are no differences. And so, um, so so we, we, I guess we have to 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 be careful in how we um, how, how we frame certain practices and be careful not to not to generalize. Of course, like with with, with everything, uh, there, there's always more to the story. And um, I'll, I'll point out a couple of things. Um, first thing is that th th there seems to be certain situations where, where no-till actually can accrue carbon and can do better than conventional till. And, and, and first of all, if you can look at sort of the, 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 the fairly um, very low hanging fruit, the things that are really logical. If you are dealing with a, with a soil that has uh, perhaps been degraded and it's far from carbon saturation, then that might be a really good you know, place where, where no-till or for that matter, any other practice would be able to increase soil carbon. If you intensify your management so you have more carbon inputs, certainly that's a way to be able to move things forward. But, but but I think most importantly, and this is really what was pointed out in the papers by, by Stephen Ogle and, and by those meta-analyses that were published in 2019, is that they found from their work is that there were certain temperature and moisture regimes when paired together where we were really seeing results where, where, where no-till was actually having a, a, a more favorable effect on the, on the carbon balance. And so, it's, you know, I'd, I encourage you to look at those papers because it, what it does is that it shows that, that there's really some, some nuance in how we need to be able to understand this whole topic. And then again, generalizations are, are, are very, very dangerous. 
the finally, the one thing, and this is very common, I mean, this is common for all of us is that, you know, soil properties often change slowly uh, in, in, in all environments and certainly in some higher environments. And sometimes we just have to be patient and wait for the, for the treatment to be able to, to fully express itself. So, so. So, I, I, I'm not, I, you know, I, I guess what I'm saying here is that that uh, uh, generally there, there, there doesn't seem to be a benefit, but there seem to be certain situations where we, we you know, the, the no till could have a uh, um, uh, could have a, a uh, an, uh, an, it could increase the, the, the soil carbon. Um, the, the other thing, and I, I, I hesitate to get into this, but carbon is, is just one component of the overall greenhouse gas balance. And I'm sure all of you, you know, recognize that, you know, we, we've been sort of, you know, talking about one particular component, but there are all these other different sources that we have to consider when, when factoring in what the overall uh, sort of mitigation or climate regulation benefit uh, or detriment is for particular practices. And, and, and the fact of the matter is that not all these gases are created equal. Again, this is stuff that I'm sure you, you understand that the, the, you know, we, we have to have to place our results on a, on a global warming potential context, taking consideration the, the, uh, the different uh, capacities of, of these gases that come from agriculture and they're, they're, they're the capacity to be able to trap heat. They're not equal. And, and so, so, so by by doing that, we can actually, I think, provide a, a more, I guess, a, a more transparent and clear picture as to what the overall benefit or detriment is of a particular practice. And I'll I'll share you one example at risk that it may actually open up a, a, a can of worms, and it could actually be a webinar topic in and of itself. But I'll I'll share with you a re some results that that I had for 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 my research here. Okay, here at Mandan, where where um, what we saw in carbon change didn't necessarily reflect when we accounted for all the factors for net GWP. If we just focus in on this SOC change, and this was uh, these were samples that that over 18 years uh, we sampled to, uh, to to over a meter at 1.2 meters. We did a, a fairly careful job with with the sampling and so forth. And the, the results that we see in, in, in carbon change really are, are unsurprising. I mean, under spring wheat fallow, uh, under no-till management, certainly a loss. There's not a lot of carbon input going into the soil. Uh, continuous spring wheat where no diversity, same type of residue going into the soil every year. Um, just um, a marginal, marginal uh, accrual rate. And then the, the spring wheat safflower rye, where the rye was being used as a, as a cover crop, essentially a snow catch to be able to, to increase a, a water capture, actually did, did, a, did a fairly decent job for no-till practice in, in the Northern Plate Range. This is Northern, Northern Great Plains. This is about where, what, we, what we'd expect. Um, but if we stopped with that story, it would be misleading. From the standpoint of mitigation practice, because when you add all of the CO2 emissions associated with inputs, farm operations, and the fluxes from methane, which is a slight uptake, but most importantly, the, the N2O flux, uh, which uh, you, you all realize is very much driven by nitrogen fertilizer application, turns out that the, really the, 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 you know, the, 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 there are substantial sources of greenhouse gases or in the case of spring wheat safflower rye, that minus 14, I can tell you, there's a lot of, there's very wide error bars there. It's not different from zero. So, so a, a, a different, I guess a different conclusion when we look at the overall balance. And again, it's maybe a bit of can of worms here and probably worthy of another webinar topic, um, but uh, it, it's just something to be, to be mindful of going forward. So, so the other thing with respect to gases and no-till is that there are other considerations that we, we should consider. That, that there, clearly there can be fewer tailpipe emissions uh, in no-till relative to conventional till. You're doing fewer passes over the field. This means you know, lower CO2 emissions from farm operations. Um, if practice long enough, um, you can actually increase your soil organic matter uh, in near surface depths as the meta-analysis show, and this can actually confer a fertility benefit from the standpoint of, of, of you know, greater end mineralization, which means the farmer could then maybe cut back on their rates of nitrogen fertilizer. And so by doing that, you have fewer inputs, so you save CO2 emissions there, but you also may have 
lower N2O emissions, depending upon what climate you're in. Um, and then also finally, and really a lot of the reasons that that no-till was developed to be able to, you know, to, 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 to protect soils from erosion and to improve soil physical properties, those improvements actually can enhance the, the aeration and the water regulation functions of the soil so that it becomes uh, more aerobic more of the time. And this can mean greater methane uptake and also lower N2O emissions. So I, I know I've been kind of playing both sides of, of, the, of the story here. I guess uh, my conclusions sort of reflect that. I think, um, you know, it, it's from the meta-analysis, at least the ones that I reviewed, um, the, the, it, an increase in soil carbon with no-till is, is, is definitely not systemic, but there does appear to be conditions that, that appear to favor carbon accrual under no-till. And so maybe it's, it's a matter of, of leveraging information sources to be able to identify where exactly uh, all of the you know the, the the components sort of overlap so that we could focus uh, focus our efforts on those particular locations where no-till might work, and then finally and uh, and again probably another uh, webinar topic but many other factors in addition to soil carbon need to be considered uh, to assess the overall uh, you know the mitigation footprint of our, our practices not just for no-till but for 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 all for all agri ecosystems and so so. Um, yeah, so just by way of transparency, I know you can't see this, but these are all the references that I reviewed uh, for uh, for this. So um, maybe we can make this available. Most likely, I missed a few, uh, and uh, and you can you can point that out to me. But if if, if this is something that is is new to you and you would like to see some uh, to, to read some of these resources, this would be a, a perhaps a, a good place to start. So. So with that, I, I'd, I'd like to thank you um, for uh, for your attention and, and look forward to uh, uh, any questions or discussions that you, you might have. Yeah, Mark, thanks a very lot, very much for this very interesting presentation. Um, I guess there are a few questions. There is one question already mentioned in the in the chat function, which says uh, Roland is citing. Uh, our work hypothesis for Western Canada is that no-till improves moisture availability under semi-arid conditions and thus increases crop biomass productivity and then in the consequence soil carbon. And, and I couldn't agree more, and I should have articulated that because that, that is really a, a cornerstone of, of the, what we think about no-till here at Mandan is that it, it is it's used first and foremost to be able to to buffer the the dry conditions and the extremes in weather. Uh, to be, and 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 in doing so, it improves our water use efficiency. Um, it can also allow us to crop more intensively. So so that means you you know you know if we go back thirty years, a fallow was often practiced in this area. But that is as no till moved in, our water use efficiency improved. We can intensify our rotations. And in the process of doing so, it's more carbon input going into the soil. And from there, it can be used as a platform to really take a system off, uh, even to the point where you can start doing cover cropping strategically. Um, and so, yeah, I agree wholeheartedly, Roland. Thanks for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe I would add also, of course, if you increase productivity, then of course you also free up land that would be used uh, needed otherwise to to be cropped huh? correct yes um yeah but any further comments or questions for mark from the audience please don't hesitate to i mean i guess for a lot of you this is really uh, not very familiar news so please take the opportunity to ask uh, mark i think there was someone mm -hmm. I think Pedro Unfortunately, I can't read your name. Uh, Pedro, yeah. Sorry. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, Mark, you did a, a fantastic uh, a display of uh, situations in which no-till can, can contribute to carbon sequestration. Um, one, one, thing, uh, one thing I would like to add to to our discussion is that um, many of the results on, on long-term experiments are, well, they are measured on plot experiments, so uh, field plots, 
And I had the, the experience of measuring uh, the, the carbon accumulation at depth in uh, oxy soils in central Brazil, in the Brazilian savannas, the cerrados. And um, we, we, have, uh, we, have, we did the, the density fractionation of organic matter and we had the particle, uh, the, the light fractions measured at depth. And under conventional tillage, we could see the effect of plowing uh, in conventional systems, that plowing actually convert in, in, a, in the soil inversion, you could put the, the plant residues at depth. Good, so then we could identify the, the contribution of plowing that could incorporate organic matter at depth and then increasing organic matter uh, and actually putting no till and conventional tilling in the same fashion. But what we didn't measure is the having the conventional tillage, we left the soil surface uncovered. And with that, we could left the soil, we could leave the soil prone to soil erosion effects due to rainfall impact. So, and in these kind of effects, like leaving the soil surface uncovered, um, uh, we, well, we could have the effect on a ramp. So we, at the landscape, in a farm, in a real farm situation, well, we could have the, the soil uncovered due to conventional tillage and leaving the whole landscape prone to soil water erosion. So, and then we could have the effect of, of soil losses in, in these uh, landscapes. Well, we could again, you know, have the discussion of, you know, carbon transference from the soil to the rivers and then but what we have seen is that, um, you know, breaking the soil aggregates, you could have the, 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 the decomposition of organic matter and leaving to uh, CO2 emissions as a consequence of tillage. Um, the know, others, yeah. Can, can you please try to shorten a little bit because we have others maybe Want yeah. To no, only if you have had these phenomena observed in your uh, evaluations. Thank you. Oh, I, I, Pedro, I, I'm so glad that you shared that from Brazil because I really struggled to find a meta-analysis focused on on the long-term work that had been done in Brazil and, and in Argentina because I know there are no-till studies there. So I'm, I'm happy that you pointed that out. I, I do believe the review by DOS uh, at all that was just coming out 2022 here in January uh, touched upon uh, some of those long-term studies, but you're, you, you point out a, 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 a significant caveat in management in that by, 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 by exposing, uh, by, by you know, turning over the residue and exposing the soil, you're actually uh, I increasing the soil to, to, uh, to, to potential loss, both by water and by wind. And that, that is, this is, this is a, this is a problem in that, uh, should it be practiced, then you have to essentially find ways to be able to to re-establish soil cover as immediately as possible, uh, whether that be for through a forage crop or cover crop or or uh, you know seeding a, a commodity crop into it. Uh, but again, you're 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 at the subject of the vagaries of the weather, and and that therein lies lies the risk. So um, so thank you for your for, for your comment and, and sharing that. Thank you. Yeah. Just, just one comment from my side. So would that somehow call for uh, calculating a kind of a co-benefit from, from mitigating uh, erosion and related, related CO2 losses? If you compare no-till with conventional tillage? Yelto, are, are you referring that to me or for to Pedro? Yeah, to you or to to all the others. That that's uh, something which has come to my mind. If if well, well, I I, I think uh, really, and and as as you phrased it, I think it really identifies why no till was developed in the first place. It was in, intended to be able to 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 st stem erosion, keep keep uh, uh, soil from from washing away or from blowing away, maintaining that soil cover, that armor. Uh, certainly, a, 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 a very important you know co-benefit. And and as Roland pointed out earlier, that can in in in, in rain-fed systems that can change your soil water balance. We have practiced over time long enough; it'll allow actually 
lend itself to to diversifying or intensifying your cropping system. Good. Maybe one last question, if there is one. May I ask one quick question? Yeah, please. Oh, oh, oh. Gibbon, your your oh. mic seems to be seems to be not. Working. So we talk about no tail. I mean, I yeah, yeah. Just I'm so sorry, Gibbon. Gibbon you, we can't understand you. It's just noises. Maybe you can type your question in the in the chat. Sorry for, but it's really hard to understand anything. If you have any knowledge or. Did any uh, analysis? Given, please, on the please we can't use. understand you. Okay. Uh, please put it in the chat function. As we call it, conservation. I think it's a person that is um, joining us with a phone. So maybe oh. has also a very bad connection, cannot hear us. Yeah. So I think we we continue here. So, sorry for that. Uh, once again, thanks a lot for this presentation, Mark, and we will continue a discussion afterwards for for both of you. So with that, I would like to hand over to Axel Don. Um, Axel, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Yelto. Thank you for initiation for your initiation of this webinar and also for organizing it. So. We come to the second part of this webinar, and it's on the question of straw incorporation and straw removal, whether this can really enhance soil organic carbon. And I hope you can see my slides. And to make it easy, we consider soils as a bucket, and the soil organic carbon SOC is uh, the material in the bucket. And in order to enhance soil organic carbon, we need more input into the bucket and the input is organic matter. It's external input with amendments. Mark mentioned it already. And it's internal carbon input. That's the crop residues, including on the straw. And in the end, we have a hole in the bucket. And this is oh. the carbon loss with mineralization and erosion, erosion, what we just discussed. And in the end, um, Mark concluded that with reduced tillage, we cannot um, decrease the size of the hole. So we will have continuous loss um, of the carbon anyhow, and we have to feed the soil with new carbon in order to maintain or even enhance the soil carbon stocks. And this is what is car um, carbon farming all about. So we need more carbon input that we put into the soil, biomass carbon that can become soil organic matter. And we can do this with more production, with crop rotation, with cover crops. Um, and we can do it also with less removal. And that's the topic for the second part of the webinar, the straw removal issue. And also, only to mention it, um, the external input is really something um, which we put um, where we take carbon from another field site in form of organic amendments in form of manure or compost and we put it to our field site and this will never be carbon farming or climate mitigation because it's only a shifting of carbon from one side to another. At a global perspective, we see here the fraction of carbon that is extracted from our ecosystems with harvest. So we have a net primary production and with harvest, we take away some parts of it. And this part of biomass that we harvest cannot be used to become soil carbon. And therefore, the higher the fraction we take away from the ecosystem, the more we deplete the soil carbon. And this is particularly the case in agriculture soils where we harvest a quite a decent fraction of carbon. So you see on this global map exactly where are the regions where we have agriculture, where we have cropland use. 
But the good thing is that in arable systems, we decide on how much carbon is left in the end. So it's not per se that all the carbon is gone, but some fraction of carbon um, can be um, yeah, determined by management, whether we leave it on the soil or whether we take it away. And here's an example from a German case study, how much carbon enters the soil and in which form every year. And we have arable systems and grassland systems. And we see um, that the majority of carbon enters the soil below ground as roots and rice deposits. We have quite a decent fraction of harvested residues, meaning straw in the end. So it's around um, three tons of straw or one ton of carbon um, that enters the soil. And um, then we have organic fertilizers and cover crops and, and stubbles as additional carbon sources. So um, the straw e equals to um, roughly 30% of the carbon input to the soil. And the straw is really um, special and particularly if we look at cereal straw, raised straw, wheat straw, it has a very wide CN ratio, so very low, um, low nutrient content, has a high lignin content, a low water content, and we could also ask the question, shouldn't we use this straw for other purposes than to leave it on the soil to become soil organic carbon? So we run into a future that we need renewable biomass sources and straw could be one of these. The question is, what happens to the soil and the soil organic carbon if we remove the straw? And here are some field studies and I start with a, a set of Swedish field studies, long-term field experiments running um, up to 56 years and you see that um, the open circles are the plots with straw removal and the filled circles are the plots um, with no straw removal. And in the end, if you look at all the six sides, you see that there is no significant effect of straw removal on soil organic carbon stocks in the long run. And that is surprising. And that was also surprising to me and to us if we looked at this data more closely, um, that even after such a long time, um, we couldn't detect any straw removal effects. And we see one side here, the side learned storp, there we see a clear difference between the straw removal plots and the straw um, incorporation plots. But this difference is were already when we in when the experiments were initiated in the 1980s. So it's not an effect of the straw removal, these differences, but it's an effect of different soil properties, some inhomogeneities at the field site. If we look at other field sites, <clears throat> there's a long-term field study from Canada, Southeast Canada. It's a clay site and they run a straw removal experiment also for um, almost 20 years. And it's um, these black uh, field dots. The, these are the measured dots. Um, they're measured three times um, in the beginning and um, here and in the end. And um, the round circle and the squared circle, these are the two treatments with and without straw removal. And you see with the two A's, they are also not statistically significant different from each other, even after a long period of time. Um, here you see, so the straw, no straw removal even has a slightly lower carbon stock than um, with the straw removal. In the end, we have to admit straw removal reduced the carbon input only by 13%. So it's only a small fraction that you take away from the carbon input to the soil. And in the end, it doesn't seem to have a, an effect on soil carbon. Another study is a meta-analysis uh, from Lou et al. from 2015. 
and they compiled um, 169 paired soil data from China. And um, all these um, data were paired sites with and without straw removal. In the end, um, they found an effect. They found that soil carbon was 12% higher in the no straw removal treatments. But here I show you the relation between the added straw on the y-axis and the additional carbon that was sequestered with all the straw that, we le that they left on the site. And if you look at this um, relation, you see um, that there is no relation between the amount of straw that they added and the additional carbon. And if you calculate how much straw carbon was retained in the soil, it's only 3%. So meaning 97% of the straw carbon that you put to the soil is mineralized. It's gone, has no effect on soil carbon because it's in the end um, back to the atmosphere as CO2. Last but not least, a global view. There is one study um, compiling 22 field experiments um, on straw removal, and they've showed that only four out of these 22 field experiments had significant effects or showed significant effects of straw removal on soil carbon stock. And a recent analysis from Martin Martin Bolinda um, quantified the straw removal effect in a global meta-analysis and they came up with a quite low number of 0.1 ton or metagram per hectare and year carbon stock change. So if you relate um, the crop residual removal effects um, to other management effects like cover crops or manure application or fertilization, it's really among the one with the least effect on soil carbon. In some sites, there might be effects, in particular, if we remove too much of the straw, but um, it really looks like the, the straw is not the key for building up soil organic carbon. But what is the key? How can we sequester more carbon? Why, um, yeah, if we cannot do it with straw, what else? And here I can give you a clear answer. If we compare the above ground biomass carbon, the straw, and the below ground biomass carbon, the root, with their effectivity to um, build up carbon, we see a very clear difference. If we put one ton of root biomass, we end up with 250 kilogram of soil carbon after three years. So 25% of the carbon that we add with the roots is retained. If we put one ton of straw, only 10% is retained in the soil, a very small bit. And we have seen it um, two slides before in the Chinese study, they came up with even lower numbers of only 3% of the carbon being retained. So root carbon is two to three times more effective in building up soil organic carbon. And therefore, if we want to enhance our carbon stocks, we have to look at the roots and enhance the root biomass that we put into the soil. And there are several publications confirming these findings. Also one publication from us from last year, where we showed that the mean residence time of carbon in the soil, and that's important for the total soil carbon stocks, is directly related to the fraction of carbon input that comes from the roots. So the more roots we put into the soil, the more carbon we get. And this is something which is valid for grasslands and for croplands. It's the same relationship. So, we could come up with other ideas. What could we do with the straw instead of putting it to the soil? And there are many possibilities. And an old idea is biofuels. 
and we might need biofuels, for example, for airplanes also in, in the future, and we need to have renewable sources to produce these fuels. Another idea is to produce biochar, enhance soil carbon with something that is really stable over long term or to use it for other purposes. Here, as an example, straw bell houses, so um, some material uses, or as an energy source, a um, renewable energy source. I will give you as an example, the biochar potential of straw. And in Germany, as an example, we produce 63 million tons of straw each year, mainly from cereals, rapeseed and maize. And only a small fraction of this straw is used for livestock bedding. Another fraction is non-harvestable. It's really not possible to reuse it and harvest it, but we end up with 90 million tons of potential, potential usable um, straw for biochar production. And if we convert this to a per hectare basis, so it's three tons of straw per hectare, and these three tons of straw would deliver 0.3 tons of biochar per hectare. And if we convert it to CO2, it's roughly one ton of CO2 that we could sequester each year if we would convert the straw into biochar. And if we put this into perspective with a carbon loss, in the worst case, we will have a small carbon loss and the carbon will in the end find a new steady state um, with a little bit lower if we remove the straw. But if we look at the biochar and the positive climate effects of biochar, we see that even after a very short time period, we, the biochar scenario is much more climate friendly than the leave the straw to become soil organic carbon scenario. Another issue, of course, are the nutrients. Straw um, uh, contains nutrients, mainly nitrogen is important. And three tons of carbon that we could remove per hectare equals 18 kilo of nitrogen. And this nitrogen has to be replaced somehow in agricultural systems. And if we replace it with mineral fertilizers, we have to account for the CO2 production of um, producing nitrogen fertilizers. And I calculated it and it's roughly 66 kilogram. So to replace the nitrogen, we need 66 kilogram of CO2 emission, but we can sequester one ton of CO2 if we convert the straw to biochar. This is the perspective somehow. So to end up, I will <coughs> um, give you some um, news about our knowledge on how soil carbon is built up because our traditional knowledge is we should put carbon into the soil biomass into the soil with a wide cn ratio that has got a low decomposition rate and with this we can contribute to soil organic matter formation and build up this is the traditional knowledge and with this knowledge we would say straw is the best biomass to enhance soil organic carbon but in fact, we see lots of new literature saying or showing that it's not the case, but carbon is mostly microbial derived. And the microbes, they have a really narrow CN ratio and litter with a narrow CN ratio enhance also microbial growth. And in the end, if we put litter with a narrow CN ratio, we could thus produce more soil organic carbon than if we put litter with a very wide CN ratio. This is something new and of course also still under discussion, but um, we see that this shift in paradigm is going on in, in soil science. So to conclude, carbon input is important to maintain um, and enhance orga organic carbon, that's for sure. Um, but root litter is much more important than above ground litter such as straw and alternative uses for straw should be considered due to the low impact of straw removal and total soil organic carbon stocks. 
Thank you for your attention. Yeah, Axel, also I and we have to thank you for this excellent presentation. Um, and I guess uh, that will raise a number of questions and uh, yeah, please feel free to raise your hand or write a question into the chat function. We will be more than happy to forward that to Axel. Uh, there was one question in the chat, uh, Axel, which says, what emissions are associated with the production of biochar? Yeah, that's a good um, question. Um, in the end, we need life cycle assessments to look at all the greenhouse gas emissions of transport of straw to a biochar plant and back to the field. But um, the life cycle assessments I saw still show a very um, positive climate um, effects of biochar production. So, um, all the, the conversion of straw into biochar is an exothermic process, meaning you produce more energy than is uh, needed to convert it. So, you don't need external energy to convert the straw into biochar. Mm -hmm. In the end, it's a climate mitigation option. Okay. Yeah. Any further questions to the straw topic? And there's one. Ah, yeah, Herr Nachtmann, Entschuldigung, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're muted. Not anymore. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank you for the great presentation. Um, uh, my question is referring to the graph where you said the. The soil sea balance, which was actually um, um, flat, and then the the char was like um, endless, uh, steep growing endless. Now, if I put that in the, um, in ref in in reference to a discussion that farmers could earn money with uh, sequest a ton of carbon, that sounds like just produce a biochar, apply it on your soil, and you have an endless source of income. Now, I know this is not the question this slide is answering, but, but is this really a, a, a linear, um, never ending um, um, a function that biochar is accumulating carbon in soil like linear until I think you it was up to tons? I don't know the. Um, the yeah, yeah. So, this yeah, is really an endless you. linear function. Yeah, and thank you for the question. Most important is the question on the stability of the biochar. So the biochar that is produced 100 years ago, will it still be in the soil? And then it's linear and cumulative somehow. Each year you add another bit of biochar to the soil. And all the studies we know is that if we put, um, if we produce biochar at decently high temperatures with pyro pyrolysis, then we produce a biochar that is very, very stable. And then you could take the straw each year, convert it to biochar and put it to the soil. And then it's an endless um, story compared to the soil organic carbon. So there it's the bucket system. You have in the end a steady state between what is flowing out of the hole and what you put in. And if you put the straw, um, you can only increase the carbon stocks once to a certain level, and then you have to maintain the management forever to have this additional carbon in the soil. So it's a huge different be difference between the two systems. Why are farmers not doing this? Biochar is too expensive at the moment, and the, the CO2 prices are too low. It's not economically sound at the moment to produce such a big amount of biochar. But um, my prediction is we will talk a lot about biochar in 10 years, the latest, um, if we need um, these sea sequestration options so to offset lots of greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, even though it's not, not uh, according to the rules, but as a moderator, may I add one question? You mentioned that it's very costly. Uh, can you give us a, a rough idea? <coughs> what order of magnitude are we talking about? 
Um, yeah, I mean, there, most biochar plants are pretty small and um, in a developing stage, but the costs are roughly between um, 200 and 400 euro per ton of CO2. Oh, okay. Good. Thanks. Um, so there was, was one question from Pedro again. Uh, I'm not sure whether I can quote that correctly. Pedro, maybe you can elaborate briefly on that. What you talk about green manuring. Uh, thank you, Yeah, so It's just uh, related to the uh, re uh, addition of nitrogen uh, by nitro uh, mineral nitro mineral fertilizer. Whether it could be replaced by green manuring, uh, how it how is it feasible in for well German conditions? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So, if you have nitrogen fixing green manuring plants or cover crop plants, then you could. Um, get it via this pathway into the system, and that's of course the best. Um, but if you don't have nitrogen fixing plants, so cover crops or green manure um, will not produce new nitrogen, but only capture the nitrogen that is there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And there is one question from Filippo. Uh, he raised the question, you said in the end, we should focus on soil input with a narrow CN ratio than was previously thought. How does this interact with current global levels of N fertilization provisions? Could this somehow be interpreted as a suggestion to further raise N input? Question mark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Thanks a lot. So, um, Mark mentioned it, the N2O emissions, they are so climate, they have such a strong climate impact. We have to be really careful with this. But um, also within agriculture systems, we have um, different organic material with different CN ratios. And we should, um, for example, the green manuring, they have much more narrow um, CN ratios and they produce, um, if incorporated into the soil, much more carbon than the straw with a wide CN ratio. So I will never recommend to go beyond uh, limits of N fertilization that are really required for production, um, agricultural production. But um, yeah, see it more. Um, in the details um, of, of management um, of, of biomass with different CN ratios. Mm -hmm. uh, may I follow up uh, on this just yeah, very briefly? Yeah, so thank you for the answer. I, I guess my, 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 my thought was precisely, yeah, uh, where does this lead, right? This conclusion that uh, the, the balance at the end needs to be a little bit narrower than, than we thought. Is it a question of I guess, I don't know, lowering levels on both sides or that we we might be okay to lower, you know, both the CNN provision, that this ratio needs to stay the same. But uh, I mean, okay, wh where does this, uh, where would do you, do you think this, uh, uh, this goes? Again, seeing as, I mean, there are obviously a lot of consequences with current current provision of, of uh, nitrogen fertilizers, right? So as you said, nitrous oxide emissions or, or eutrophication. I mean, how does this interact? Is it that, okay, is it possible to drop this nitrogen and nitrogen input levels and yet we could still remove uh, straws and not have any effects or uh, do cover crops potentially provide that um, balance better with uh, uh, with more automatic regulation of this uh, ratio? I hope this somehow makes sense on this talk. I cannot answer this because this depends so much on the region and the agriculture systems you're working in. And maybe we can consult the agri benchmark um, data to find out where do we have um, a nitrogen surplus in the systems and where we can lower um, or where there is enough nitrogen there. And in other regions, we need more nitrogen. So there is no general answer to this, mm -hmm. but we need to be careful with the nitrogen management. So without a very efficient and good nitrogen management in our agricultural systems, we will never be successful with carbon farming because keep in mind, carbon farming is more than only sequestering soil carbon. We have to look at the total greenhouse gas balance. Mark showed it very nicely. 
Um, so it's all about climate mitigation and that's, that means we need to look at the total perspective on all greenhouse gases. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I have one more question regarding the biochar. Um, is there any data available on benefits over and beyond the accumulation of carbon in the soil? So, like water holding capacities of soil and, and stuff related to that. Yeah, there is a huge biochar community working on this and promoting this. And in the end, we um, it comes down to the question, is it yield effective? Does it enhance our productivity? And we see that in climate regions with a mean annual temperature below 10 degrees Celsius, there is no yield effect. But in all regions with higher temperatures than 10 degrees Celsius, we see yield effects on average. That means in particular in the semi-arid and in the dry regions, the hotter regions, we sometimes see amazing effects of biochar addition. And that's really on top of what I calculated as a climate mitigation effect. And of course, for the moment, we should really look and try to find the synergies of our um, agriculture management practices to also enhance productivity, enhance biodiversity, clean um, water bodies, all these kinds of additional aspects we should consider and biochar could be in one region, in some regions, a very good solution with many cool benefits. Yeah. Just one comment. I mean, if you really see yield benefits, then of course the whole uh, uh, greenhouse gas balance will then also look completely different, and and also then the the mitigation cost, of course, go back dramatically. If you if you have like a six ton harvest or eight ton harvest and it goes up only five percent, then you have additional benefits that that would be uh, able to to offset the cost for producing biochar. Maybe Mark can comment on the situation with biochar in the US, but I know that in Germany there are no yield effects and biochar is almost nowhere applied um, in reality from farmers. No, you, 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 you said it exactly right, uh, Yalta, or uh, Axel, that the, the cost is very limiting and, and as particularly as we get uh, to, to it, it's where it's used, it's almost like a horticultural type of arrangement where it's very small scale and focused and high, high value crops. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then there was one question in the chat, Frank, which I'm not really sure whether I got it. So maybe I is, can, can you, can you please put forward your question? Yeah, no, I think uh, my question was answered. It, it was basically just about the nitrogen management. Ah, okay. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, so if there are no specific questions more to, or particular to the, to the two presenters, I would try to raise a more general question because, I mean, we started the whole debate from the, from, from the fact that both increasing uh, or reducing tillage and increasing straw incorporation is, so to speak, the backbone of mitigation strategies in crop production so far. Um, what 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 is left, so to speak? And uh, if I'm not mistaken, then the whole cover crop topic is uh, is is one which, at least in principle, has has some potential. If I'm not not mistaken, so. Maybe Mark and or Axel, can you elaborate a little bit on that? What what strategies you think would be needed, or maybe even what research is needed in order to confirm what is out there? So do you want me to go first? Yeah, please. Okay, yeah. all right. So so what but I think of, of, of potential strategies that could be deployed by uh, by producers in, in in a matter that in, in, in framework that is really relatable to them, um, 
the, the, the one, one thing that really shines for, for me from the standpoint of, of carbon cruel is uh, having a, a living root in, in the soil as, as long as you possibly can. And I think as, as Axel very well pointed out in, in the one diagram, uh, root biomass and the carbon it contributes is a, is a huge factor. And so, so with that in mind, then we have to, have to ask ourselves then in what ways can we integrate uh, cover crops uh, either as full season forages or as uh, relay intercropping or some other novel way to uh, upon the climate and, and soil uh, constraints that, uh, that you may be dealing with. The, the other thing that, that, um, uh, that is, 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 is worth consideration is, is the, the whole role of, of perennials on the agricultural landscape. Um, and, and perhaps there are, are, are uh, specific locations that may be uh, typically low yielding from an agronomic standpoint and maybe don't really, uh, uh, may, 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 may actually provide uh, a broader suite of ecosystem services if they were put into perennial vegetation. Now, um, uh, thereby focusing agricultural production on, on the most productive uh, parts of, of the landscape. And so, um, so getting back to that living root and extending the season as long as possible, I guess, would be the, the one thing where I would, I, would, uh, I would focus. So I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Axel, you want to continue? Yeah, I, I totally agree with Mark. So this is the first thing to do. So we uh, do not want to leave the soil unvegetated. This is really a waste of solar energy that is not converted into biomass and, uh, uh, and soil carbon. And if we look at the potential, there is still a huge potential to increase the area of cover crops. And it's always a discussion with the water, the available water. And at least um, in Europe, we see that there is more and more uh, research showing um, that and the cover crops that are growing only till the first frost, let's say in December or January, um, they are not taking away water of the main crops of the next year. So there is no um, danger to the next um, cropping period in terms of water. Um, but it might be different in, in other regions in the Mediterranean or in more drier regions. But cover crops are the first thing to do. And the second thing is to look more to the roots. So we uh, look at different genotypes, so cultivars of our main crops, wheat and maize. And we saw there are huge differences in the root biomass of these crop types. And if the farmer could select the, the genotypes, the cultivars with more roots, he could really help to build up soil carbon without changing the management. And the good news is without compromising the yield. So we looked at the relation between root production and yield, and we thought if the plant puts a lot of um, energy and carbon into building roots, then they would have lower yields. But this is not the case. So if we can have both the same or enhanced yields and more roots, we only need to have it as a new criteria for breeding. And this is something um, which is new to the breeders because they have to dig and find <laughs> out how many roots they have got. <laughs> yeah, interesting. <clears throat> yeah, more questions or comments to that outlook debate. Yeah, Yannick, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much. First of all, um, <clears throat> Axel, um, because you pointed out uh, that you already had a look on different varieties and their root mass, uh, was there a correlation whether it was a variety focusing on quality or quantity in terms of root mass? Do you know anything about that or is it more random and not really? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question and I will have to go back to the data sets, but to be honest, we, we are still on the way to publish these data and to analyze them. And there are only 12, 15 studies globally where we have root biomass for different genotypes and cultivars. So um, we are really at the beginning of a new 
research topic, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I guess that that would also then include also the evaluation of uh, of cover crops, right? They probably also differ. Definitely. I've been sampling cover crop roots um, last week. We were digging a lot. We, are bring, we brought uh, three tons of soil into our lab to wash out the roots because there are only a few roots in there <laughs> and we have to <laughs> wash a lot. And, and, but we already saw that there are huge differences. And I can tell you the grass, the grass species, they have got much more roots. And in the end, it's an agronomical um, task really to find solutions. How can we use grass species as cover crops? I know the farmers, they don't like the grass species as cover crops. But if we want to enhance soil carbon, we have to find solutions also to work with grass species as cover crops, I would say. Maintain Roundup, I guess. Huh? Um, Anna has raised her hand. Just to share with you some results that I had with rice field in Costa Rica. Well, uh, it was very surprising for us that uh, we compare uh, our management with a producer manager management. Uh, and the, the producer has only one roller after the tillage and uh, we measured both density in uh, two others three properties of, of physics properties of the soil and how the roots grow and it was incredible because we just don't use the roller we get twice a rise and we get a, a, we have a more a, hydraulic a, b, b, rate of water penetration in the soil. It was very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just the differ this difference. Don't use the roller on, between the producer and I and our experiment. We just don't put the roller, and also we try, uh, we we measured the um, compactation, compact, compactation of the soil, and we uh, removed the compactation of the soil, and the yield was significant, increased significantly. Mm -hmm. So it's just two little things that you can do in the soil management that can increase the yield and the and the roots that's our experience okay yeah thank you, thank you very much um thomas you raised your hand yes thank you uh, once again for the great presentations um I, I have a question which might be a little bit off topic uh, for both, but I would like to use a chance of uh, having two soil scientists in the room. Uh, one, one other um, field or area looking uh, in, to increase fertility of the soil is this discussion on, on biologicals, so adding uh, or uh, improving the um, uh, microbes in the soil uh, by adding a special or special treatment, things like that. Is, did you look at that also as an option to, to improve soil fertility or are they aware of any, let's say, reliable um, studies, how effective or promising this, um, this way of, of improving the soil fertility could be? I'll take a stab at it and okay. then people can follow. Sorry. Uh, Yes, yeah, so so uh, thank you, Thomas, for the, for the question. This is a uh, this is a very hot topic uh, here in the states. Uh, soil biology and soil health is uh, uh, are are one and the same, and so people are often looking for ways to be able to uh, 
to sort of supercharge their soils in order to 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 obtain fertility benefits um, in 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 the near term. And um, um, I, so I, I have not researched this. So so there's, this is uh, to take my comments with a grain of salt. But I I often look at the the. The, these application of microbes and the the amount of microbes that are actually being applied to the soil relative to the to the overall microbial biomass that we would might see in the in let's say that the, the the top ten centimeters and it is it is such a a small amount that it, it is is really hard to 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 imagine that there there could be a, a significant impact and yet there are many anecdotal. Uh, observations that su suggest that there is, and so, so w what do we do? Well, we, well, we need to research this. This is a, 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 a I think, a, a new and promising uh, area. I, I, you know, when when I am approached by farmers about this, um, I have to be very careful because there are often products that are, you know, that are being applied. And as a USDA scientist, I can't, you know, offer. A, a, a support to any 1 product over the other, but what I often do is I say. Do what you can within the realm of traditional soil health practices to build your soil microbial community. So maintain your cover, have that living root, minimize your disturbance, uh, you know, uh, use balanced fertility, increase your diversity, and so forth. And where you can integrate livestock, that will go a long ways in building the microbial community. And then beyond beyond that for specific targeted uh, influences with these applications. We'll just have to see what the science uh, says in the future. So stop there. I, I totally agreed with you, Mark. There's a good reason why we have a certain microbial community in the soil, and this is the environment, the environmental conditions. So how many um, nutrients are there and something to eat? So there's all organic matter, matter matters a lot. And I only know of one um, Swiss experiment where they put effective microorganisms to the soil and they monitored um, these um, microorganisms over time. And they found that within weeks, these added microorganisms are not detectable anymore. And that's very clear and obvious. So if there is not an environment for these new effective microorganisms that they can survive, you could put tons and tons of microorganisms of this sort to the soil and they will, they will disappear very, very, very fast. And then they cannot really help the soil to become better. So as Mark said, you need to improve the conditions for the microorganisms and do a management that really fosters microorganisms. Um, and that the key thing is to have a good um, carbon source for them. So if you enhance the soil organic carbon, you also enhance the microorganisms and their activity. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, so there's one last question before we have to close down our session for today and that is Filippo. Uh, many thanks. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to keep this quick, but you might just point me to the first half of uh, of the seminar. So my apologies because I wasn't able to uh, to see the first presentation on on tillage practices, um, and so I'm not sure exactly what you 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 concluded. I have some idea, but uh, since we started exploring cover crop as okay, maybe this is where we should go now, given that the the results on the, on the, on sequestration are not as promising from these other practices. I was wondering if if there isn't this key interaction to consider with cover crops of reduced or or no tillage. So, it, what are what are your thoughts maybe on indirect, on the indirect benefit of reduced tillage? As uh, my understanding is that anyways it's important for this for the the root web, right? And so to to preserve uh, uh, the whole root system underground, which is really from again my understanding what you said might make the difference might be the number one factor and so as something to to support it um i mean what are your thoughts on on this i mean does does this make it worth it is there no effects but again if you answered this question in the first part then my apologies and just just let me know no, Filippo, that's a, that's a really good question. We we did uh, talk a, a, a little bit uh, about this. It actually came as a as a chat question, and I I think what what I think where these these uh, the, the no tillage and, and and cover crops interact 
um, at least from from a perspective of a, of a dry land cropping system uh, 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 situation, is that the, the no-till actually can can uh, in, enhance uh, soil structure to improve soil water properties, to allow you to retain more water, and then that which would provide sort of a platform to intensify your cropping system. That's where you can certainly go to continuous cropping, but maybe in some instances, including cover crops, because as Axel pointed out. Water, water is a, is, is, a, is a concern that many producers have with the inclusion of, of, of cover crops, but no-till creates a soil structural environment that, that uh, I think um, sort of enhances that water regulation benefit that could uh, foster their inclusion. So I'll stop there. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot for, for this interesting question and the, the answer as well, of course. Yeah, I'm afraid we, we are running out of time, so... Um, I would like to very, very much welcome and thank uh, both Axel and uh, Mark for their presentation. As indicated before, uh, the the presentations as well as the recording will be available. Uh, so reach out to us and uh, we will let you know. And uh, yeah, with that, I would like to close the meeting and uh, have a nice day for those who are still uh, awake. Okay, all the best, bye. Congrats, very good meeting. Bye. Fantastico. Thank you. Bye. Bye, many thanks.